I don't know, I, I woke up feeling quite cheerful, and now I'm really depressed and terrified. <laughs> Aren't you? So... And um, I thought I was going to talk to a fashion audience, not politics, terrorism, and macroeconomics. But um, I'm going to just um, give you a slightly more personal stance and, and maybe some lessons that I learnt myself um, from trying to navigate some of these things. You've got to remember that actually it's been worse than this before, and the 70s were much worse. Um, I left Holland Park Comprehensive with a pottery A-level, and um, I immediately um, joined a band. And I learned from the music business that um, it's possible to create your own destiny. You know, you, you learn your own instrument, you create your own tunes, you book your own gigs, you make your own poster, and then if you're lucky or if you're talented, you sign a deal with a bigger company that distributes your stuff. So it, it gave me at least a, a, an inkling of um, understanding that uh, creativity can be turned into into business, and you know British people are reasonably good at that music. Um, I did have a motorbike crash and I broke my arm on the evening of, of a tour, and um, that killed my music career, stone dead. But luckily, in the interim, I'd been making things for fun, and I'm showing you some of my early work, not because it's beautiful but because it's really quite ugly, it's uh, quite dangerous, it's very rusty. Um, but what it is, is made with my own hands, with no investment, no money, no tools, um, and no uh, new materials either. It's all scrap found on the street. So again, um, I transferred my uh, understanding of creating businesses into, um, from, from the music business into um, what became a design business just through practice. And, you know, in the early 80s, which is when this dates from, there was no design museum, there's no design pages in the Sunday Times, there was no, um, no, we, no luxury furnishings business at all in the UK. Everything was happening in Italy or in Japan or in Germany. And we looked at them um, in awe and um, hoped that one day we could be like them or that we could work in, in, in France or in Japan. So anyway, uh, I'll just uh, fast forward and get to the subject. So um, maybe 25 or 30 years later, I have my own label um, under my own name, um, which is Tom Dixon. And it's a good snappy name for branding, if you like. And it produces furniture, lighting, and accessories that we distribute in 65 countries around the world. And we have an office in New York, one in um, London, and one in Hong Kong. And um, I've actually mimicked the fashion business. Um, and the reason that is, is because the furniture business is, um, I didn't realize that the screen was going to be covered by the big voice logo. But if below the voices is a typical, um, a typical furniture business called Vitra, which is a Swiss, amazing, multinational uh, manufacturing business, which is the brand. And underneath that brand sit maybe 30 or 40 designers that are freelance designers that are their own brands, if you like, but um, uh, marketed and distributed and manufactured by the manufacturing brand. Um, so for a designer, it's not a particularly great place to um, express yourself. You're fighting against um, some dead designers, the great giants of design from the 60s, like the Eames, or uh, the direct competition, like Jasper Morrison and the Brillet brothers from France. But you're fighting in a very unequal battle. And I've always admired fashion for um, the fact that you can have your own um, point of view and your own aesthetic, and you can broadcast it, and you can put it in your own shops and the rest of it. So we're mimicking the fashion business, and we're probably the only um, label in our industry that does it. Um, and the way I de develop products is not conventional either. I'll just give you a quick story about this product, which is a, um, a lamp, yeah, which has been reasonably successful for the last um, eight years or so, um, which is the advantage of the fashion business. I mean, the, the product business versus fashion. Things stick around a bit longer. Um, and it's kind of came from a not-for-profit trip to um, India, where we were looking at... Uh, retaining metalwork skills in, in rural uh, Jaipur. 
Um, historically, these beautiful metal pots have been made um, for generations by skilled um, metal workers in the city, and they're rapidly vanishing as tourism comes in and, and the spaces are reallocated to boutique hotels and such. And also the pots themselves are being replaced very quickly by um, much cheaper industrialized equivalents like these plastic pots, um, presumably made in China. Um, so the project was really just to try and uh, work out if we could um, transfer um, the skills to um, to a different functionality. And you can see that all over eBay um, are these lamps. Um, unfortunately, not made by me or the skilled metal workers of, of India, but made industrially in parts of Asia. So um, that's when I start talking really about the need for speed and um, how the consumer wants instant gratification is addicted to lower prices. We've got this great product. It is employing probably 20 metal workers in, now in Muradabad in, in northeastern India, um, skilled metal workers that are maintaining a craft. But we're being overwhelmed by these much cheaper copies that we can do nothing about because design isn't protected in the way that publishing is. Um, and uh, we even provide um, copyists with um, the files dimension files online because we have to provide that information for architects to put into their CAD plans to do interior design. So 20 pages of eBay with Tom Dixon lights at 26 pounds. As if I don't buy them, They're, they are copies inferior. And um, that's why I've started looking at a bit at how we can be faster to market because the copying is becoming faster and faster as, um, as uh, the accessibility of the imagery and the um, universal, uh, universal manufacturing processes um, can uh, copy much, much faster than before. And the furniture business is an inelegant business um, altogether. It's very much um, one of those businesses where designers design in the West and you get things made in a much lower cost economy on the other side of the world. And then you ship large quantities um, to a European warehouse, and then it goes out to small shops, and then sits on a dusty furniture floor waiting for a consumer to maybe buy one or two chairs. And it's just not a modern business. It's not been disrupted yet like so many other businesses have, particularly music. You know. So I had this idea that maybe I could um, disrupt the business and get not only instant gratification for me as a designer, it takes so long to get a chair out and selling in the world, but also for the consumer as well. Mm. And I thought the cleverest thing to do was to try and be like Google and um, give away my core service for free and on the side pay for it in a different way. In this case, by advertising. So just like Google, um, giving away my core business, but paying for it by doing something else. So I, I, I made in the UK 1,000 chairs, um, delivered them to Trafalgar Square, um, and I became very popular very quickly. Um, and instead of this two-year cycle of investing heavily in, in Asia and then shipping things across the world, I shipped from um, Huddersfield to Trafalgar Square, one container load of chairs and got rid of them in six minutes. People become very greedy in this context. Some people tried to take two chairs um, and none of them had worked out how to take these things home at all. So even on the tube, you saw lots of people struggling to get through the doors with these chairs. And um, I've, so, so th there's means of, of being faster um, as a designer, but also as a brand and trying to mimic other, other businesses by selling off advertising on the chair. Uh, I hope you're listening QIC because I want to do this in Australia, but we could, we could easily um, sell little portions of the chair and then I can guarantee your message goes into um, people's homes and stays there for three or four years rather than what would happen if you were doing a television advert or even a BOF conference. Yeah. But I started to feel much more stupid um, when these chairs started arriving on eBay. And you can see that they start at 50 pounds and then they go rapidly up to 200 pounds. So my thousand chairs could have made me 200,000 pounds. And the sponsorship really probably gave me a tenth of that if I was lucky. So that wasn't a great project. Um, and <laughs> but at least I tried, right? And so 
I think, you know, in the, in the last talk, there's this, you know, terror about impending doom, which is coming. The robots particularly are coming in manufacturing industry, which means that um, all your jobs are going to be taken over. But there is a window of opportunity right now, which we're trying to exploit, um, which is to do with the speed at which you can now, as a designer, make things. Now, everybody's obsessed with rapid prototyping, which is a very flexible and modern way of making um, very expensive plastic things. Um, I'm much more interested in all the slightly more um, underlying techniques that exist, which are now digitalized. So these very efficient robots make all of these different components that you see on the undercarriages of cars or the back of washing machines and the rest of it. And they're very sophisticated, very flexible. Um, and I decided to team up with a German robot maker to see if I could design something that suited the robot. So I took the robot, I tried to go beyond IKEA, and I took the robot to where the consumer was, which was the Milan Furniture Fair, and I, I designed a chair to suit the capabilities of the machine. So this is me looking smug with my, um, my chair, which is made on site. We made a whole restaurant in Milan with a couple hundred chairs and lights, and um, it showed the potential for um, deconstructed manufacturing and also very flexible manufacturing. You see me looking even smugger now, I'm in New York with my machine, and I'm making in the New York Furniture Fair these lamps, which use the same programs and are infinitely flexible in terms of size or the pattern that you um, can indent in them. So um, what I'm saying is that there, there, you know, there are some businesses and some, and, and fashion is one of them where there's been many attempts to um, make to measure or make to order or deconstruct the supply chain. Um, but only now is the power of computing and the tools that designers use and industry uses um, overlapping sufficiently for what's been happening in the music business for a long time, which is that you can make a record in your bedroom, um, is now starting to happen also in the product world as well. So that was, um, yeah, how you jump on the digital rev revolution. And then this is uh, going back to that story about copying. Addiction to Cheapness this is quite a nice website, uh, IKEA Hackers website, which teaches you how to make a Tom Dixon lamp for $20 by buying um, an IKEA bowl, drilling a hole in it, and hanging it upside down to make a, a, an equivalent. <laughs> um, so this, I was like, I was momentarily furious until I just thought, how brilliant is this? I've got to do something like this myself. Um, and so... Uh, I approached IKEA and started talking about doing a collaboration, again, inspired by the, the fashion people that are quite content to do uh, upscale and low-scale Jill Sander for Uniqlo or, or whatever it is. And I thought maybe we could do this as well. And um, I tried, I pitched to them with an IKEA, um, an IKEA format. Um, first, I wanted to do a cot and a coffin, um, and they thought that was inappropriate. So, and then later on, I just thought of a bed. The bed is the perfect unit of furnishing um, in as much as everybody needs a bed. It doesn't matter if you're in prison, you're camping, you're in the army, you're on your deathbed, everybody needs a bed. It's pretty much the only thing you really need um, in, in, in furniture, but I'm not going to do it through my own company because it's a boring piece of furniture and logistically it's impossible, it's very bulky, everybody has different comfort um, requirements, Americans like big beds, etc. So I wouldn't do a bed, but I can get IKEA to do a bed for me. And, um, and then I can sell bits on the side. So my idea here is to be a bit more like Hewlett Packard, where um, so, you know, th there's this, this um, you know, photocopier that requires lots of upgrades and inks and the rest of it, and I'm going to sell a sheepskin cover. I'm going to sell a marble headboard. So it's going to be pimp, pimp my IKEA bed is my, is my plan. But more importantly, we've added to that a, 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 an ecosystem inspired a bit by, um, let's say, the Apple phone, where we actually actively encourage people to add um, apps and add functionalities to the bed. So we've got 25 students of the Royal College working on it, 25 at Parsons in New York, <coughs> and 25 in, in Tokyo, um, bright young minds uh, thinking much better additions to this platform than I ever could, and it's turned into a raft, it's turned into a, a double-decker bed, it's turned into um, a sofa system for airports as well.
So the bed becomes a sofa with my additions, and then becomes even more with a, a network of sub-suppliers that are feeding onto this platform. So that's due for 2018. Um, so I think I'm probably running out of time. And I just thought, OK, these are my attempts at being faster, more flexible, um, ignoring my intuition, like the last speaker was advising me to do, dealing with trying to mimic fashion business and, and um, internet businesses. But this is maybe the opposite. Is, you know, in, in the end, can we continue to be even faster and to consume faster and to make things much, much faster? I've, I've, I've come up with a, a, an opposite plan, which is a bit like slow food in Italy. And this is my underwater furniture factory. So the idea here is that if it all goes tits up, which is quite likely to, according to all the previous speakers, <laughs> I'm, my, my, um, my retirement plan is to head to the Bahamas and, and um, fish for furniture. So I've got, <laughs> I've got um, a friend who's a pirate in uh, Nassau in the Bahamas that has set up a solar panel and I've made some metal frameworks which allow me to have underwater grain a series of, of furniture um, which is there at the moment, only slightly damaged by the last hurricane. And, and what it does is a, it's, a, it's a technique invented by a 70s scientist that um, um, was ostensibly to create um, floating cities. Um, it didn't really work out but it's quite a good way of, of a, doing carbon capture, because what you do is you charge the metal framework with a small amount of electricity, and just like the fur on a kettle, it starts accreting um, a calcium deposit, which grows quite quickly um, because of the, of the electrical power, um, so that a, a metal rod, which might have been five millimeters to start by the, by the first year, is um, 12 millimeters, and the second year is, is 20 millimeters. So eventually these chairs will become um, solid stone um, or a kind of coral substitute. And you can kind of see um, growing on the chairs um, quite a lot of marine life. And they provide also quite an attractive environment for uh, not only coral that you can graft on and grows also at five times the rate of, of coral in the, in the natural environment, but a great hiding place for fish and lobsters and shrimp and sponges um, to avoid fishermen as well. So um, here you see, after two years, the accretion of the calcium, which is calcium carbonate, same as limestone or chalk, um, which is actually capturing carbon also from the atmosphere, and the sponges growing on my new stone chairs. And here you see me, almost naked, um, fishing my first chair out of um, the sea in, a, in this fabulous retreat in the Bahamas, which could be the sort of thing you should be looking at as well. Yep. So I think I'll, I'll leave you with that message of potential positivity and, um, <laughs> and say that maybe the best thing to do is not to, you know, to race, all race towards instant gratification, which I've been guilty of, or, or, or trying to go faster the whole time, but maybe slow down completely and do things which may take three or four or eight years to mature and sell them in a smaller and more um, select way. Yep. Okay.